So some of you felt a warm, happy feeling as you listened to my colleague Rich describe the wonderful world of collaborating, collaborating and sharing, and happy people who need no incentives. Um, I'm now going to throw Rich under the bus. <laughs> Everybody knows Texas is filled with communists, and obviously Rich is just one more instance of a communist from Texas. I don't care anything in my argument here about the warm, fuzzy people who want to find a way to collaborate and share without any economic incentive. Instead, I want to focus precisely on what we should be arguing from the perspective, you heard I clerked for Judge Richard Posner, the founder of Law and Economics and Extraordinary Conservative Justice, and Justice Scalia, one of the most conservative on the Supreme Court. I want to focus at the, on this from the perspective of these conservative economic people. So here's what the resolution is. Copyright law excessively restrains the development of intellectual property. Earlier in our discussions, the suggestion was we would have this as the resolution, that copyright law restrains the development of intellectual property. And it was suggested that the other side would make an argument like this, that economic incentives are required to stimulate the development of IP and that without copyright protection, the economic incentives are diminished, resulting in the creation of less IP. Now, the problem I had with this framing of the debate, and in particular, the problem I had standing up against this argument, is in fact, I agree with this argument. And I don't know how anybody whose brain is actually firing could disagree with this argument, because obviously, economic incentives requ are required for many people to produce great new work. Not everybody, not the communists from Texas, but <laughs> lots of people to produce great new work. And they are diminished. Obviously, they are diminished if the uh, incentives are reduced such that they can't recoup the costs which they incur in order to produce their great new work. So that's why this is not the discussion we're having. This is the discussion, whether the current copyright law excessively restrains the development. And excessive, if you can freely copy from this dictionary, means this, more than is necessary, normal, or desirable, immoderate. He was drinking an excessive amount of brandy. Now, if I tell you he's drinking an excessive amount of brandy, doesn't mean I'm against brandy. If I tell you the heat is too hot, it's excessive in this room, it doesn't mean I'm against heat. If I tell you, you tell me this introduction is excessively long, it's not, doesn't mean that you're against introductions. The point is, this is a relative argument. The question is, do we have protections more than necessary? Does current IP law regulate more than necessary? Well, here's the experiences I want you to think about. I get letters like this all the time. Dear Mr. Lessig, I know you're probably a busy person, but I was hoping you could answer a small question, should be paren for free, about concerning copyright law in the public domain. I am currently a junior in high school in a small town in Iowa. For a while now, I've been wanting to do a project of making an online database of farm manuals. Iowa. John Deere tractor manuals, repair manuals, etc. They, of course, need to be in the public domain. Okay, remember, this is a high school student. As far as I can tell from my research, the 1976 Copyright Act made all texts available after June, for January 1st, 78, automatically protected, blah, blah, blah. I believe you could go closer to the Burn Convention Implementation Act. <laughs> This is a high school student, junior high school student. But for right now, I'd just be focused on the pre-78 works with no copyright notice on there. I also check the copyright records as well. Well, at least in my mind, the above statement makes it clear to myself that it would be perfectly legal to do this. One of my business law teachers disagrees with me. He won't give me a straight answer as to why he believes this is illegal, but for some reason he believes it is. <laughs> Now, you might think, if you thought that I was like the communist over here, <clears throat> that I had some sympathy with this high school student. Of course I don't. They pester me all the time. And I don't want to. <laughs> it's the poor business law teacher that I feel sorry for because he can give us no straight answer because, as you know, there is no straight answer to this question whether this kid is able to take these farm manuals and put them up on the internet freely. If there was no copyright notice, then for a certain section of those works, it's automatically in the public domain. But for another section of 
of those works, even if there's no copyright notice, it's still not clear. It's in the public domain. He's going to have to check the records. Of course, where are the records for these farm manuals? He's going to have to go to some particular libraries to look them up. The point is, you know, it is insanely complex. Okay, number, no, number two example. We ran a site to try to get people to tell us stories about how copyright law was actually operating in their life, the Kale versus Ashcroft. This is a common pattern that we got repeated again and again. <clears throat> Somebody submitted this. He didn't want his name repeated. My brother Tony, a Navy fighter pilot, was killed in his Navy plane November 13th, 1959. Last fall, Kinko's refused to allow me to make copies of his picture without a written release from the professional photographer that took the picture. Information on the back of the picture is 2723-N. Of course, it's easy to know who to ask from that. I have no idea how the photographer is or how to contact them to get permission. It took some place, I took it someplace else, broke the law and copied it anyway. So sue me. <laughs> now, of course, this is not an accident. If you go to Kinko's or FedEx Kinko's now and look for their policies, their policies are this. Regardless of the age, at least if it's less than what they think is 95 years, they will not allow you to copy a professional photographer, uh, photograph unless you've got explicit permission from the photographer, right? Or here's a favorite example. Alan and I have talked about this before. This company created this project. Um, renamed the Google Book Search Project, aimed to Googleize books. What would that mean? Well, they saw three categories of books out there. Um, 18 million books, 9% of those books were in copyright and in print. 16% of those books were in the public domain, meaning 75% of those books were either uh, were presumptively under copyright but out of print. Google Book Search said they're going to scan everything, grant access to these books, differentially. So they said three categories. The public domain, they would give full access. That would mean you would get the full book. You can download it as a PDF. For the works presumptively under copyright, you'd get at least snippet access. There it is, snippets of what you would get. And then for works in print and in copyright, you'd get as much as the publisher allowed, which means it could be a couple of pages, more pages, depending on the publisher. Now, as you know, not everybody loves Google, and as people around the world know, in America at least, if you don't love someone, you typically get around to suing them. <laughs> and the essence of the claim, I don't want to have a debate about the claim, but the essence of the claim is you, pres you needed permission first for anything presumptively under copyright to scan even for the of purpose of building an archive, now, a digital archive of an index. So that didn't matter much for these public domain works. It didn't matter much for these works either, because we know who to ask. But the point to focus is that if the rule is you need permission to even scan for the purpose of producing an index, then 75% of these works effectively disappear because there's no wholesale way under our system to get access to this. Now, all three cases. The problem is not copyright law. The problem is an inefficient copyright system. A system, a property system that fails to do its first job. Every property system is supposed to be able to tell us who owns what. This system doesn't do that. It is regulating, in this sense, more than necessary because an extraordinary amount of, thi of this work has no need for copyright protection, and the authors would tell you if you ask them. And even those that want copyright protection, we can't even find out who the authors are. Now, why is it like that? Well, the simplest answer is America went French. We gave <laughs> up the formalities that our framers gave us, the affirmative steps necessary to get or keep copyright, a system that produced cop clarity and separated out works that needed copyright protection from works that don't, and we went to the automatic system for a limited time of term that determined how long your copyright would extend. So that's, I'm sorry, that's 1790, uh, 42 years, 1831, 1956 year, right? Uh, 59, the maximum term. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, I'll get to it eventually. Here, just a second. Uh, 74, then, oh yeah, now 95 years for that term of a limited time. Now, originally that didn't matter. 1976, it didn't matter. The analog world, as Jessica Littman said, tech, the law was technical, inconsistent, difficult to understand, but it didn't apply to very many people or very many things. But in the digital world, this regulation is now applying to everybody, as Littman said. Most of us can no longer spend even an hour without colliding with copyright law because copyright law triggers its application upon the production of a copy. And in the digital world, every single use of creative work produces a copy, meaning we are radically excessive 
in the regulation that we are imposing for the perfectly legitimate objective of creating incentives for authors to produce great new works. It's stopping all sorts of works, like the Google project, or this kid, or this kid, stops them unnecessarily relative to the legitimate objectives of copyright law. It's therefore excessively restraining current development of IP, which is why you should vote yes on this proposition. Thank you very much.